Thanks a lot. We were having a very lively conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Truth be told, we were talking about cronuts. <laughs> I swear, I swear to God. In fact, David's written an amazing, he wrote an amazing piece about cronuts. Google David Simon cronuts, <laughs> and you're in for a, uh, a culinary and literary treat. <laughs> Hello. That was oversold. <laughs> uh, the, first, the first comment was completely oversold. Go on now. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out on a weekend morning. Um, I asked David and Tom to come out here because uh, uh, I've known Tom for a while now and, and knew David just a little bit. We'd run into each other on the panel circuit or at various TV things. Um, and I personally have been dying for years to hear the conversation that we're about to have, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> because because uh, these two guys, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with their careers and, and the amazing shows that they've made, uh, but they are more responsible in my mind than anyone uh, for TV taking a turn into something uh, more elevated, sophisticated, uh, uh, deeper, more challenging, risky, uh, starting in the late 90s and going into the early aughts. It really the television we're all watching now is a direct result of the innovations that these guys brought um, to HBO, which was the only game in town uh, back then. So while we could spend many, many hours talking about all of their shows, we're going to talk about mostly that specific time. And then when we get to questions from you guys, uh, you can ask about anything you want. So. I want to start with Homicide ah. and Baltimore, yes. and that's how you guys got to know each other, right? That's, that's right. I, I'll, I'll tell you uh, quickly, um, Barry Levinson was sent the book Homicide, A Year on the Killing Street, um, and as to do it as a feature. And he read the book and he said, oh, no, 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 this is, there's too much good stuff here. We have to do it as a series. So uh, they uh, brought me on, and Barry and I went down to uh, Balto, and uh, I met David for the first time, and he basically hated me. <laughs> he, I was clearly the enemy. I was going to take this, which I, I believe is the best book about crime uh, ever written, but I was going to take this perfect child of his and completely destroy it and turn it into, you know, Dukes of Hazards or something. <laughs> and, uh, and over time, he, he came to understand that uh, I wasn't clever enough to turn it into Dukes of Hazards. <laughs> I was just going to do the book as best I could. The Dukes of Hazards, there would have been viewers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have to be talk Don, Don Olmeyer into season after season of this <laughs> cop show he didn't know he was making in Baltimore. Uh, David, tell us a, a bit about where the book came from. Uh, the homicide unit in Baltimore let me in for a year. Um, it's very simple. Uh, it was the police commissioner, and I asked to go in as an uh, uh, unpaid observer for 1988, and they, for reasons we can't even begin to get into, he said yes. And so the book came out in 91, and yes, it went to Barry, and that's how I met Tom. And I will say, you had really long hair, First time I met you, and I, I had, had hair. It, and I had hair. Yeah. Okay. And I had hair. Um, it was. Uh, it was. I guess it was. Uh, what, what year was that? But ninety-two. Ninety-two. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety-two. When you first started showing up, and um, I, I was pretty um, haughty about being nonfiction boy. I, I don't know. I, there was no actual. <laughs> that was our nickname for him. Yeah. <laughs> nonfiction boy. Yeah, and, and I'll let you run with that rule. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so when you guys first started working on the show, David, were you uh, functioning mostly in a consulting capacity? I mean, did you know early on that you wanted to be involved or maybe go into television? I, or were you just going to try to keep this fucker honest? I, I, I didn't, I mean, I sort of, they sent me the first scripts and I would make these elaborately long notes of like, you know, trying to explain like the absurdities of, of you know the, the Baltimore Police Department's vehicle logs and how they like stuff that. Oh, you, you know. have to tell. So we had dinner last night, and all of the best stories were already told last night. So I'm sorry. So, you get you get that's like. Why we're so weak? You get like yeah. the B minus version. Of wine the the, the early takes. The early yeah. takes are always the best takes. <laughs> um, um. But you got to tell the the ripple in the in the water story, if you can. Oh, the 
example. In 50 words or less. Oh, no, yeah. well, go for it, Tom. Well, <laughs> you go. I mean, the, the truth is I had a very minimal role in the show until about season four because I went back to being a reporter. Um, I, there was this weird stepchild in my town, and they were doing this um, drama based on, and, uh, you know, in fact, you guys, Gail called me and said, do you want to try to write the pilot? And I said to her, I, do you take me for a fool? I mean, you know, <laughs> here's a chance, there's a chance, like, I looked at the structure, and, like, the longer the show went, mm -hmm. the more money I got in checks. So I said, get somebody who knows what they're doing. And, <laughs> I said, but later on, if you know, once you have a template, I'll try my hand at one, and, and that's how myself and David Mills started with you, yeah. and uh, and so that was. I mean, I didn't really go full full in. I was not in his employ until season four, and the show was already an established fact, and it, and it really was Tom's template. It was, it was you know, Tom and Barry took a book that, if you made that book into a television show, it would not have been. It was you know, there's a lot of anti drama. In, in, in reality, and so it, it became its own its own creature, and necessarily so, and, and to be admired. But I needed to see it actually exist before I could even contemplate it or, or any role in it. Did you feel? Sorry, go ahead, Tom. Well, I, are you going to tell the bowling ball story? <laughs> so that's, 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 okay, <laughs> save. It. Uh, we will. We'll get, come back to it. All right. Did you did you feel at the time? This is kind of an unfair question because you were in the moment and you didn't know where the future was going necessarily, or maybe you did, but did you feel you were doing something different? You know, I mean, I, I see well, Homicide as a precursor to sort of opening up a, a space for HBO to exist. Yeah. It, 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 uh, uh, when, when Barry called me about being the showrunner, um, he said, yeah, I want to do this cop show in Baltimore. And I was like, oh, geez, I don't know, a cop show. Ugh, you know, nobody's going to do it better than Hill Street Blues. I just, I was like, I was like really grumpy about it. And he said, um, no, I want to do a cop show where there's no gun battles and no car chases. And I said, that's impossible, I'm in. <laughs> because it seems so patently absurd that we could get, we could pull this off. And... Barry, Barry really took care of the visual style of the show um, in the sense of doing the jump cuts and doing the, we never, we nev never did a perfect master. Um, we would shoot, we would shoot this way and then we'd shoot this way and then we'd shoot that way. Um, and what was great about that was the actors always had to be on their game. There was no, oh, it's not my take so I, don't, I can relax. And, um, Anyway, so it was all sort, I don't know if we were sitting there going like, uh, I guess what we were trying to do was not repeat what other cop shows had done. We weren't trying to create some phenomenon. We were just trying to go, let's just not fall into the, you know, uh, the patterns that we've seen over the decades. Because the cop show and the doctor show, and I had done St. Elsewhere, they're the two basic kinds of shows, on, drama series on television. And if you're, if you're gonna try to do them, you really have to sort of blow them up in order to do them, I think, for, an, for a, a new audience. Because with, with YouTube and everything, you can watch everything that's ever been, practically everything that's ever been on. So, you know, we all have to be cleverer. So you, you must have, either fall in love with Baltimore or been a glutton for punishment because your next show, you decide, okay, back to Baltimore. Tell us how Oz came together. Uh, did that start as Homicide was winding down or? No, we, we did them both simultaneously uh, for about two years. Um, and thank God I had people like David and Jimmy Ashimura and Jorge Zamacona and Julie Martin uh, doing Homicide because I, I knew I knew they needed me less and less, so I was able to focus more and more on Oz. But we only shot the presentation. Emotionally, we were. <laughs> well, it was hard keeping you out of the bars. That was true. But um, uh, so 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 uh, we shot the this presentation uh, for HBO, 15-minute presentation. And I'm going to tell a terrible secret now. 
HBO didn't give me that much money because they had never done a drama series before, so they were they were incredibly like, geez, what's this gonna what's this gonna be like? And also to say, yeah, we're gonna do this happy little prison show. <laughs> and and uh, so they didn't quite give me enough money. So I ended up using like NBC's money. <laughs> I, <laughs> I would say we would shoot a scene for homicide, and then I'd say to our line producer, you know, we could shoot that scene for Oz here now. <laughs> and then we <laughs> so, so that's how we were able to put it together. But I'll tell you one remarkable thing about, about Chris Albrecht, who's now running Stars, but was the man who made HBO. We finished this 15-minute presentation, and we, Barry Levinson and I were, flew to LA, because we're both East Coast people, and, um, and, and, and Chris says, oh, come on in, we'll watch it together. <laughs> so the three of us, Chris Albrecht, Barry Levinson, and I, sit in Chris's office, we watch it, he goes, great, let's make it. <laughs> now, there was no marketing, there was no <laughs> testing, there was no, <laughs> There was no, he asked maybe two questions and said, great, make 13 of them. So I was like, holy sure. <laughs> I had to leave before they put him in a straitjacket and took him off to Bellevue. Did, did, did Chris come to you or did you, were you aware HBO was? Uh, it's what like what had crucial... happened was I had been pitching a, a, a show about prisons uh, constantly. A, a lot of it came out of working on Homicide because even though on Homicide we never, well, we rarely actually caught anybody, um, but, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, you watch cop shows all your life, and at the end, the bad guy goes to prison, and the, and the regular the cops go, yay, great, and you go, well, what happened to that guy, you know, who went to prison? And I, and I grew up in western New York when Attica happened, and so that had a very deep effect on, on my little psyche as well. So, um, so what happened was I just said, uh, I, I went around pitching. Now you can imagine going to CBS and pitching this prison show. <laughs> they were like, look, they, let, they were gonna put me in the straitjacket. No, because you know, I, I watched the pilot recently again, uh, just to refresh myself. And what I was so struck by is how, uh, I mean, compared to anything right now, it's one of the boldest things out there. I mean, you're tackling race, you're tackling socioeconomic status, you're tackling gender, you're tackling uh, homosexuality, you're tackling the justice system, you're tackling big universal fucking existential and, despair. And the POV is from a place that it never had been. Absolutely, and, and that's all in the first episode. You know, <laughs> plus you had the direct address way before we did. Um, with, with the incredible Augustus Hill device yeah. that gave you this sort of pulsing, uh, um, a visceral, direct access into that world. And to think of that material be approaching any even broadcast network now, much less back then, yeah. is a kind of form of insanity. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely insane. But, but, what, but what happened was a friend of mine uh, uh, was over at HBO because they had they'd started whispering that they were thinking of doing a drama series. And, and, what, and Chris said, you know, we have, we have pretty good success with our prison documentaries. Well, my friend got up, went to a phone, called me in New York and said, get on a plane. There's someone stupid enough to make your prison show. <laughs> But were you at all skeptical? I mean, this is, this is the place that basically, you know, put VHS tapes in and played movies or did boxing, right? And they well, had a what, what happened was everybody I knew in the business said, this is the stupidest move you've ever made. Nobody watches HBO. And I said, they're going to let me do anything I want. <laughs> anything. I go, I don't care if no one watches this. <laughs> Now, around this time, David, uh, you were starting to embark in television writing yourself. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I was work when he was shooting the the test piece. I was on staff by then. So okay, I, right. Yeah, I don't. I, know, I don't have the watching, exact chronology. I was watching them abscond with the the equipment, <laughs> <laughs> go down the block on Fame Street, and you know, 
<laughs> shoot out this scene and then, you know, second unit would come back over here. Yeah, I watched all that happen. Uh, can you, I mean, writing is, well, an incredibly hard thing to begin with, but uh, you had already had a career as a journalist and now you were embarking into this, this sort of new territory. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Tom taking you under yeah, his wing? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I actually, I, I, I was, I think I was in television for about 15 years before I had to admit that I wasn't going to go back and, and be a newspaper reporter. I mean, that, I, it was really the absence of a decision for me. And I don't think I took it as seriously as I should have when given the opportunity. It was, you got to remember, it was, it, I was indulged. It was my own book as the original source material, so I could certainly write in the vernacular of, of cops. I had that. I, I didn't understand the structure very well. Um, well, it was the opposite of what you had to do, because you have, yeah. in newspaper reporting, you have to do who, what, when, where, why, and how in the first paragraph. Yeah. And we have to do it in the last scene. But yeah, I know. mean, but, but I'd already been working on books, and so, so I had sort of a narrative prose that was different from Pyramid Style and all, but right. no, the pacing. I mean, I, remember, I still have the first script you marked up on mine, and it, it is, um, it's funny, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, it bleeds, and where it bleeds is, you know, my pacing is just brutal. I, like, everyone's explaining everything, everyone is verbal, every, you know, there's no, nobody does anything in a look. It's all just, you know, um, the, the guy would say this, and he'd say it like this, and, 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 and there would be sentence fragments, because he wouldn't get a full sentence out, and so, like, you know, it's the way, it, it was, it, I was doing verisimilitude, yeah. and nothing else, and there, it had no dramatic form. And so, the only thing I could tell, having now been on the, as, you, as we all have been, on the side of other writers coming in, like, the only thing I credit myself with is, because you can't credit everybody with it, sadly, is it, all the red marks in the paper. I looked at it and said, okay, this, I, this didn't get in, this didn't get in, this, this got changed to that, and wow, that was great. This that I had no regard for actually turned out to be a good scene. So it's like the biofeedback of doing it, you know, over the time, and, I, I should tell the story of like, okay, so I wrote two scripts. I, I wrote a script with David Mills. Right. That was the first one. And that got, brought Robin Williams to our show, right. which it, basically saved the show the second season. Right. And about, I would say about half of that was me and David, and half of it was probably you and Jim. And, and you know, once they got, and first of all, we'd made mistakes in the script, they, they improved. And then, second of all, once you get Robin Williams, you write more for Robin Williams to get, and, and so a lot of the stuff. Yeah, but the script ran, and it won the WGA award, and David quit his job at the Washington Post and, like, was gone. Like, I mean, I, th I don't think he left his apartment. He left everything in his apartment. He was in L.A. the next day. <laughs> and, and he called me. He said, get out here. And I said, and I was working on the second, I was working on my second book at the time, uh, and, and I was not, I was uncommitted to television in any way. And he said, you're an idiot, and uh, I'll see you later. And, <laughs> and then... It was fourth season. You guys gave me a second script, and David by then was working on uh, NYPD right. Blue for David Milch, and they gave me a script. And this is this is uh, this is my favorite story about Tom because it's it's every promise kept. But but it, it's just like okay, so I wrote I wrote these scripts, and they both had a lot of real cop stuff in them because you know that's what my stock and trade. And if you're if you're running a cop show. You just need grist. You need, like, give me a good cop story that I can make. Into, so, like, I gave that to both of them. So David Milch calls me and says, and, you know, he'll cop to the quote. He goes, get out here. I'll give you more money than God. That was <laughs> David Milch's quote. Tom says, come to work on the show. I'll show you how we do this. That, those were the two pitches. And he even said, he said, look, I don't have, because he knew about the other offer. He said, I don't have Botchko money. That's what he said. <laughs> but I'll show you how to do this. And that, coupled with the fact that I didn't have to pick up and move, I had a little, you know, I stayed in Baltimore. Um, I went to work for Tom, and, and, and that was the, the, and then the whole dynamic was the, um, the acquisition of not just the writing part of it, which is hard enough to get this new form, but the writing is only, it's just a script. It, it doesn't exist in any way that matters to him. Like, I can't, oh, this was a really great TV show that, you know, we were going to make, but we actually never filmed it because doesn't matter, you know. It, it's the it's the execution of the script into into film into in th that it's, it's if not it's half the well it's maybe not half the best forty percent of you know it's something. Right. But the rest that, is editing. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mean all you know so like 
Second season, okay, now you're not so dangerous that I can't send you to set. Go to set. <laughs> Protect the script on set. Okay, it's now, you've been with us 18 episodes, you're gonna go to casting. Only the day players, but you can cast the day players. <laughs> you know, and like eventually, like it got down to like finally, like, I think the penultimate season, you know, now you're gonna get to go into the editing room with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to talk. You know? So, but it was he, like, he, uh, by the end, I knew how to make television. The promise was, I'll show you how to do this. And, and that really was, this is, this is my tutorial right here. This guy. Wow. Don't worry. Oh. I, 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 that's very, very sweet. But it, it, Jimmy Ashimura, who we both mentioned, was a major influence uh, on David as well. And, uh, In many dark ways as well. <laughs> <laughs> Should I? <clears throat> They used to um, sit in, in uh, uh, Jim's office, and uh, the network would call from <laughs> would call from LA with the notes, and they would get naked and dance. No, no, no. <laughs> and everyone would they go, "Oh yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea." <laughs> Tom is referring to the antler dance. Yes. That's Jim. Na Jim named it the antler dance, which was. Jim would put the, the phone, he would drag it from his desk, he'd put it in the floor. And then the network would start giving their notes, which, you know, Tom, Tom you can imitate the notes. Give, give me an NBC note. Uh, uh, does uh, Giridello have to be uh, talking about his mother? Can he be talking about the crime? Wait. Can it be more redemptive? Can't... You know, are there, where, are the, where are the victories? Where are the victories? Where are the victories? <laughs> so, Jim would, Jim's the, 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 we, Jim would steal us, you know, where we would have to not laugh. And we'd have to, our voices would convey, that's a really interesting note. I think we'll try to incorporate that with a line or two. Like, if, to hear us in LA, we sounded like we were cooperating. But we were dancing around the phone, and Jim would put, like, you know, use his fingers to make antlers. And by the end of the call, we would sort of, it is true we had our, our flies open, and <laughs> and we would sort of stick our thumbs as if we were as if we were pissing on the phone. But this, we we never actually pissed on the phone or got naked. But we we did simulate a lot of ugly, and that was known as the antler dance. Yeah. And 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 it got to the point where it was never like you know come in, we, we, we're, getting out, we're getting network notes on 6, you know, on 612. It was always, come on, we got an antler dance, you know. And, you know. The, the only thing, I, I never asked them not to do it. The only thing I ever did was, uh, PBS was shooting a documentary about uh, homicide, and I said, please just don't do the antler dance. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm asking. I don't care what else happens, just don't do the antler dance. All right, don't worry, we'll get to the wire in a moment. But before we get there, um, the first season of Oz, you write it, you shoot it. Um, by the way, you had mentioned to me before at one of our lunches that you, you would write the character's story throughout the entire season on its own, and then later you would sort of weave them all together into episodes. So can you talk just a little bit about that? But also, now you've made this thing, HBO starts putting it out, first time they've ever put original content out uh, to that degree. What was the feeling at the time? What was the reaction from Chris? What, what, how did you perceive the reaction of the world? Did it feel like a click into you know, a new vault, into a, a new chamber? Okay, TV's different now. Well, again, I mean, with, like, as with Homicide, I wasn't like setting out to do anything other than tell these stories the best way I could. And one of the th people people always say to me, "Oh, when you did Oz, uh, Oz, you didn't have to worry about the censors. You know, you could use any language you want or show any kind of physical violence or sexuality." And that actually wasn't the most liberating thing. What was the most liberating thing is there were no commercials, and I could, uh, on a episode by episode basis, tell the individual stories for however long. I needed to tell them. So in, in one episode, the Saeed story might be 25 minutes of the show. And the next week, it could be two minutes of the show. 
And that was so liberating that it, 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 it was exhilarating to write the show that way. And so that's how I developed the idea that I would sit at the beginning of the year and I'd write all of the Beecher scenes, then I'd write all of the O'Reilly scenes, then all the Said scenes, so, et cetera, et cetera. And then as I was getting closer to production, I would fold the scenes um, together to make an episode. The ironic part is every once in a while I'd get to a scene to put into an episode and realize I'd killed the character two episodes before. <laughs> so that got a little dicey sometimes. Um, the reaction to the show, Chris couldn't have been more uh, supportive. And uh, there was a moment where there was an op-ed uh, uh, piece about, that mentioned the show, it wasn't about Oz, that mentioned the show in the New York Times. And he called me and he said, this is more important to me than getting a rave in the TV section. Right. I, want, I want this show and every show we do to be on every page, the sports page, whatever we can get on, because those are the people I need to reach. The television watchers will come or they won't come, but all those people are who I need to find. What was the, my favorite review for Oz was TV Guide, now we, uh, our first season we were on in the summer, uh, because why wouldn't you want to watch a prison show in the summer? <laughs> and um, so TV Guide, God rest its uh, little soul, um, uh, <laughs> the, the, the critic for the, I guess they only had one critic, and he was on his summer vacation, because no shows were premiering in the summer, so he had three months to do whatever he was doing. So his editor forces him to come back and watch Oz and write a review. And I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it because I, don't, I, I, I honestly did not memorize it, but he basically said, Oz is an offense against God. <laughs> okay? So I, being the asshole that I am, I call the editor-in-chief of TV Guide, and I go, look, I don't, it doesn't bother me that he didn't like the show. Does TV Guide speak for God? <laughs> and the editor fell apart. He said, it's all my fault. I forced him. He was pissed off at me. And he put, and he took it out on you. So. <laughs> but I, I just can't wait till the, I'm going up to the pearly gates. <laughs> and St. Peter says, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Because they've got the box set. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, uh, before there was The Wire, there was The Corner. And so just, you've, got, you've got Big Brother here, first child who's like broken in the parents a little bit. How Did HBO come to you? No, or did you go, no. Oh, this wow, is, this, this is, is the last stage of the, of, the, of the mentorship. This is hilarious because... This is where you become a Jedi so, Knight. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the... Um, uh, I come out with a second book. The first book was about a year spent with these homicide detectives. The second year is about a book on a drug corner at sort of the height of the, of the cocaine epidemic in Baltimore um, when, when crack hit. And uh, I'm working on Homicide, uh, the show, and I'm prepping the second book, and I'm thinking probably after Homicide ends, I'm going back to, I, you know, I started a standing offer from the Washington Post. I'm probably going back to that, to newspapering. But, it, you know, it would be nice to do something to help this book, you know, sell a few more copies. But man, the content is way too, too you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a drug corner. I mean, if you know the content of the corner, it was a, is, is a very hard story about the culture of addiction and, and this one broken nuclear family that, that was in this neighborhood. And I just thought, there, you know, there's no television logic that can sustain, you know, this. And, and, and then I look at the 15 minute piece of Oz. <laughs> And all of a sudden, it was like, somebody's putting this on TV? <laughs> I mean, it, it was literally, that the DNA of what HBO came, became is right in Oz. The Oz is the, a lot of people, you know, Sopranos came on before The Wire, and everyone said, oh, well, they saw what Sopranos, you know, we were working on The Wire before we ever saw Sopranos, because we were, you know, we were on our own little path, and, and Sopranos wasn't on the air yet, but Oz was in our heads. Oz was the thing that said, there are no advertisers, so nobody can get offended. Um, people watch it or they don't watch. Well, God can get offended. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that's right. 
There's no, you know, no telling what he can do. But, um, you know, this was, so I went to Tom and I said, you know, listen, I, I, I didn't think this book was going to had a shot, but I just saw that little prison show you're making, and that's, that's not exactly a happy romp. So um, what do you think? And Tom was like for it. And then I think, I think we can, I'm not trying to lay him out here, but, but you know, Tom, Tom and Barry were joined at the hip. Uh, and, and I think Barry, if I had to guess, I never had a conversation with Barry directly about it, but if I had to guess, I'd say it was a very, very dark, painful slice of Baltimore. Yeah. And, and Barry felt like Baltimore had already had one bite of the apple with homicide, and I don't think he felt like he could go there. So I'm like, and he calls me back and says, nah, we're not, you know, I don't think we're going to jump on this, but I made some calls at HBO. You have a meeting with Anthemopolis. And I did. And so I went to the meeting alone without him, you know, and, and that was it. And so, uh, and, and I pitched them The Wire at that meeting. I didn't just, I didn't pitch them a miniseries. I thought, I didn't know what a miniseries was. I pitched them The Wire. I said, this would be half the show from the, from the street side, and we'd actually follow it up higher into the sort of the, the drug hierarchy. But the other side would be law enforcement and why the war on drugs is fucked up. And, and, and so I, I, and it'd be continuing and it would be fictional. And they who had, you know, Carrie who had read the book uh, said, you know, in the, in the meeting with Chris said, just do the book. Just do, give us six hours on the book and use, make it real and make it sort of documentarian. And that began it. So uh, it, the wire came off the table. And then I was, but it ha the DNA of my whole entire association with HBO is, is from, from, from watching Oz and from, and Tom, so. Okay, so I have two more questions before I want to turn it over to you guys. I'm sure there's many questions from the audience. Um, the first one is, you look at Oz, you look at the corner, the corner becomes the wire, you look at shows like Deadwood, Carnival, um, really risky, chancy stuff that HBO was doing, whether they realized how risky they were being or not. Sopranos comes onto the scene, eventually Sex and the City will come onto the scene. Uh, this unproven entity suddenly now has massive viewership. Uh, people are paying subscriptions to watch TV. What was it like working at HBO with these two really raw, bold shows while that whole phenomenon started to happen beside you? Well, it, it was great. Uh, I mean, we, we, and a lot of the shows were being not done in New York. Uh, the Sopranos was, Sex and the City was. So we would constantly be seeing each other. And so it became a little like HBO community uh, 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 that, that started to exist. Um, but it, I mean, it didn't, no, nothing that happened changed the way I did Oz, except for the fact that I got to a point where I said, I, I, I know I have one more season I don't think I have two, and um, I'd rather just us all decide now we're going to stop after after this next season. And they they were very willing to do that, probably because they had so many other great shows going at that point. And um, uh, so I was able. The hardest thing about doing episodic television is you get canceled, you don't finish it, you know, and and. And for storytellers, we want to finish the story we started. So I was very grateful that HBO was understanding of that and let me, let me um, kill the beast. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll go to the sort of, they were good and bad. Uh, there was HBO pre the phenomenon of Sopranos and, and Sex and the City where, and I got a little taste of that, but you were basically there at the, at the origins, which was, as you, as you describe, you got an idea, have I never seen it on TV before? I've never seen it on TV, go do it. You know, it was just throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing what stick, there was, there was not, they weren't aiming the ball, right. um, which if you know the baseball vernacular, you know, when you th get out there and throw, you're, you're at your best. You start aiming the ball, you can't hit the strike zone. And so they were, this was the opposite of aiming the ball. They were like, they gave people who had delivered television hours before the chance to do exact, you know, write exactly what you think it should be. And those were the early days. And, 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 
And some of that still remains at HBO, but something did happen when, when they had these huge hits with, you know, and God bless that they did have them because it subsidized people like us, you know. I mean, The Wire never had an audience until after, and... Um, I, I like to think of The Wire as the Velvet Underground of, of TV. The only, <laughs> like only a few hundred thousand people watched it when it aired, but they all started TV shows. Right, they were all... Yeah. Yeah. I was at that gig, I swear. Um, so, I mean, the... Uh, you know, they used to, I mean, I remember we got terrible numbers for season three. Our numbers were going down by season three um, and, and never came back. And, and we were getting killed by Desperate Housewives. Killed, the NFL had now started counter-programming on Sunday night. And our, we had this incredibly small number. They, you know, the, the Sunday night opportunity was gone. And I remember calling Carolyn Strauss and saying, are we canceled? And she said, oh, it's a cute little number. Don't you worry. That was her... Can you just hear her? She's like, oh, it's a cute little yeah. number. Don't, yeah. don't you worry about numbers. And that, they could afford to be that way because in some ways we were being subsidized by Sopranos and that. Yeah. So I'm not, like, I'm not saying, oh, it was a bad thing. Sopranos is a brilliant show and, and God, bless, God bless what it did for HBO. But the backside of that was, there was a, after that there was a lot of like aiming the ball of like we can make another Sopranos or we can, we can, we can do this, we can do that. And there was a lot less of why are we telling the story? Has it never been on TV? How do you feel? You, 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 got, you see where the story's going? Is the story worth the telling? Go tell it. Those days, you know, I haven't experienced that since. I, I totally agree with you. It, there's a very bizarre phenomenon that happens in television, which probably happens everywhere, but success breeds fear as much as failure does. And that's what happened at, at HBO. They started they became afraid that they weren't going to find the next Sopranos and, and, it, it, and that they could actually dictate what the next Sopranos was going to be. The other thing that happened uh, is that uh, HBO, which was owned by uh, Time Warner, merged, Time Warner merged with AOL and uh, in an ill-fated ill marriage, and it, it, like, also happened to a lot of the broadcast networks, the corporate nature of uh, the day-to-day the -day life at HBO changed. Chris could no longer sit in a room with two people and say, let's make it. He was no longer free to do that because there, was, because there were too many uh, corporate entities at stake now. Right, a lot of HBO profit went to sustaining the parent company. Yeah. So there was, you know, all of a sudden there were margins that you had to obey. That's, I don't want to suggest that there's not really good work being done at HBO, because, listen, I got to make a piece last year about housing in Yonkers and, and dis desegregation. <laughs> but think about, think about six hours on housing, on housing policy and hypersegregation. I mean, that's a subsidized piece where somebody at HBO is saying, Go make that, I haven't seen it. That's still happening. But it's happening for, you know, it's happening because of Game of Thrones, again, is, is subsidizing all of us. So that, that model is still somewhat operate, operant. But it's also happening because it's six hours in Yonkers. It's not, you know, I didn't ask for 90, 10, 90 million to make, you know, it, like they understand that's not gonna be the next Sopranos. We're, that's still part of our brand. But yeah, there's a big chunk of id that is, you know, looking for that. I told All you right, to put I'm a gonna, dragon I'm gonna, in that show, but you wouldn't listen to me. What? I told you to put a dragon in that show, but you wouldn't listen. I'm gonna. To inter, I'm gonna uh, interrupt. The closest so I can get was Alfred Molina. We, we need yeah. to leave a little bit of time for for questions here. So listen, there's two microphones. If you have a question, come up to the microphone. Maybe form a couple lines. While you're doing that, I'm gonna ask my last question. So we don't have. We only have about 15 or so minutes. So if you want to ask a question, don't be shy. Get up there. Um, there's a lot of talk in, uh, in the entertainment industry right now, in film, certainly TV, about a uh, huge lack of diversity behind the camera and from the camera. Out of the gates at HBO, you guys uh, created two of the most diverse shows that have ever been on television, uh, especially you know, compared to what came before, and certainly um, still compared, unfortunately, to, to most of what's out there now. Um, were you consciously thinking about that? Or were you just saying, hey, we're trying to re just reflect the world? That, that's all I was trying to do. I, I did a lot, of, I did two years of research in prisons. 
and uh, fortunately was able to go home every night. And, um, and I just, I looked at the communities that existed in prisons and I thought that those are the people whose stories I have to tell. I do remember, I think there was some of that DNA also in homicide, the credit homicide, which is, I remember there was one moment early in one of the seasons where there was a, just a, it happened this way, there was a conversation between four characters in the squad room, and it was uh, Andre Brower's character, uh, Clark's character, Yafet, and uh, the, the actor who played Bornfather, uh, yeah, uh, oh, and now I'm embarrassing myself, <laughs> I've worked with him, I'm, I'm just having a brain fart, but f we had four um, characters, and they all happened to be African American. And it was like, we didn't, when we wrote it, we didn't notice it. When we, but like when it was on screen, it was like, you know what? Well, that, that moment happens in Bal the Baltimore homicide unit all the time, but it doesn't happen on American TV all the time. So uh, was, Andre actually came up to me, because I was on set when we shot that scene, and he's the one who pointed it out to me. And he said, I can't believe I was just in a scene with four, with three other. African Americans, and we didn't about talk race. about. There was nothing about race. It yeah, was, it was just about. It was who, that that classic test uh, of the, the Bechdel test. Yeah, uh, it was the Bechdel but, test for yeah. for race. But um, Clayton LaBeouf was the fourth actor. Sorry. Okay, speaking of diversity, by the way, we got five gentlemen up here. <laughs> uh, if there, <clears throat> if there are any women that'd like to ask a question, because we don't have much time, I'm sure some of these gentlemen will allow. <laughs> Some of you, there we go. This gentleman right here is gonna let you skip the line. Um, and in, in the meantime, sir, why don't we begin with you? Um, quick aside, I was at, in, in, uh, at Time Inc. in the magazine side when that merger happened and it was just hell on earth uh, uh, with AOL. My real question, um, whatever happened to the Batman project you were doing? The which one? Batman project you were doing, what you were developing with DC Comics. Oh God! You know, I have wanted to. They asked me to do it to to write a DC uh, graphic novel, and every time I think I have the time to do it, something else comes along, and I and it, you you have to do those for love, and I don't always have the time for love. I sometimes have to make money, <laughs> so um, it's very funny because my assistant just found the file and said. You wrote a DC comic? And I went, no, I started it. <laughs> so someday, it's like with the Sistine Chapel. I'm gonna just keep working on it over the course of my life. Um, it's kind of depressing. I was wondering, what was the most upsetting death you've written on The Wire and then in Oz and then overall in your careers? Because there's been a lot of death in your show. So just wondering, what yeah. was most personally upsetting to uh, you? From, for me, it would be Wallace because it was the first. Uh, and the actor, uh, who of course has managed to find some measure of a career, <laughs> um, uh, he was he was this little skinny kid who you know he was a really good actor, uh, and and he was so he was so beloved by the crew that when we when the pages came out, we started hearing from the crew, you know, like you know, grips are walking up to you going, you know, you can't kill Wallace, much. <laughs> What kind of asshole kills Wallace? You know? <laughs> and so, and then I, I had to go to his trailer and, like, you know, the first time I didn't want to, you, gotta, you can't just send him the script. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. You know, good news and bad news. And, you know. <laughs> and, um, and and he was just like he was beloved by the crew. So it was like it was not just the, you know, I mean I'm sorry, but it's attenuated for me. I know it's a script. I know we're making a TV show. You know, what the actual? I know I'm not really killing. Anybody. <laughs> so, like, if you're on the inside of it, I can't pretend to be. We weren't weeping when we were getting the coverage, but you know, the idea that we weren't going to get to work with him, any, that, that Michael, you know, that was that was the part. I, I, for me, I think it's important to keep the audience when you're going to do um, a show like Homicide or a show like Oz to keep the audience um, unsettled. Uh, um, uh, as opposed to making like Prozac television, CSI something, um, I, I think it's important for us to make shows that that uh, the audience is in the same seat as the characters, not knowing if they're going to live or die. And when when I went to talk to Chris Albrecht about uh, Oz, he said, "What's the one thing you've never been allowed to do in a television series?" And I said, kill the lead in the pilot. <laughs> and he said, do it. And that's uh, Ortolani, 
made it all the way to the end of the pilot and then was, was murdered. Um, I have to, a personal note, my wife and I are currently watching um, the last season, uh, uh, this past season of uh, House of Cards. And I don't know if you've all seen it, but <laughs> someone gets killed and my wife was apoplectic. She was, <laughs> you tell that Bo Willeman. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, no, I'll tell him, I'll tell him. So, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't come to close to the house anytime soon, though. <laughs> Sir, um, so uh, both of you uh, deal with dysfunctional institutions and systems, mainly, in your writing, and uh, how they fail at the intersection of corruption and incompetence. And I'm wondering, when you deal with that daily, how do you maintain motivation and optimism about your writing? <laughs> and then when you deal with that incompetence and that uh, corruption in the TV industry and in the production process and all of that, how do you maintain motivation and optimism? Um, I, I'll do this really quick. I, 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 this is no place for a sort of political dis discourse and you know and you don't want it but um would you like Bo and i to leave no, <laughs> no but, although before david would agree to do this he's like they just passed that fucking open carry law we we cannot we cannot support that by doing it at a venue where that law is uh, uh, allowed to exist. But, so you're in a venue where no one has a gun at least we think uh, that was the price of admission also i just you know I'd go first. <laughs> <laughs> Venue with guns. I've made a lot of, you know, I've irritated a lot of people. Um, very quickly, uh, I, I, I'm fascinated by how institutions, I find these, I find institutions to be elemental and necessary to, to modern life. Um, and as somebody who used to be a reporter, I feel like they need constant, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a permanent state of argument that society requires. Uh, it ne we're never going to fix everything, and it's never going to be perfect. Um, and every day you have to kill some snakes. And that's the only way that sort of centrist democracy and, and a republic can work. Um, and, and, and what you need is you need, you need external vigilance, and you need uh, the hierarchical nature of institutions to be challenged from within and from without. Uh, and it's hard, and it's hard work, and, it never, and the job will never be done. And it, but it's the only grown-up way of looking at it. So for me, I was always amazed when people watched The Wire and said, oh, well, you know, uh, institutions will always, you know, like they, they, the, the sort of the libertarian doomsday of, that wasn't the message. The message was, this is our, this is our city. This, this is stand-in for us. You know, go kill snakes. And the one, the one thing I would add to that is, I think what both uh, David and I try to do, and Bo as well, is even if you create uh, some despicable characters, they have an internal spirit that is uh, awesome to want to be a part of, watching it at least. And, and that, I, you know, I'm constantly amazed on House of Cards how much I dislike those two people and how much I want them to win. <laughs> It's, it's absurd, and I, I think that, to me, is the key, is if the character, you can put a character in a prison, but if the character, if the human spirit is burning inside him or her, then the audience will be engaged by it on a double level. Wow. So, and and yeah. uh, just so you know, we're, we're about five or six minutes out, so keep the questions brief and keep the answers briefer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is strangely uh, coincidental, actually. This is all for all three of you, if possible. Um, so there's something inherently fascinating about watching characters make bad decisions. How, f how do you know how far you can push characters into this territory of moral, ethical boundaries and still before they become unrootable for the audience? And what is your perspective on crossing that line? Um, very quickly, I don't think of, in terms of good or bad characters. I just think, you know, what would the guy do? What are his choices? Who, you know, where is he coming from? Where is he trying to get to? What's the move? You know, wh what are the possible chess moves? You know, and, or, and sometimes there, it's the move of the heart that is completely antithetical, but that's what you feel like the character would do. But I don't get to the page and go, oh, this guy's a bad guy, so he's gonna do, you know. 
the, you're done if you do that. That's I think Tom, Tom hit the nail on the head. Uh, people live in the moment. People don't live usually thinking of their lives and most of the time in an ethical and moral framework. Uh, they are uh, burdened by confronting necessity, uh, practical, pragmatic obstacles that they have to overcome. Uh, and, uh, and everyone, even the most despicable people out there, are actually trying to do the best they can. And as long as you give them that, then they will tell you. And, uh, and that makes them relatable and universal. You'll never cross the line where they become uninteresting. You might cross the line and become unlikable, but who gives a fuck about that? <laughs> we're, we're trying to do something interesting, not something that you like. You know, oftentimes, you, you probably often, all of you, uh, at some point or another, dated people you really didn't like, but were really <laughs> attracted to, right? <laughs> so it's the same way with TV. <laughs> Without benefits. You want to weigh in, Tom? No, no, I, I, I'm with the two. All more. right, we got two more. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, one more. So Both two, of you go. <laughs> two, <laughs> two, more, two more in a very this, fast bowling ball yeah, story. Was, yeah. All right, speed oh, yeah, round. Right. Go. All right, so real quick, um, I have worked in Baltimore for 10 years, so I want to thank you guys for putting you know, that out there. It's, uh, yeah. If you can't but, tell, he's um, wearing a lot of <laughs> But um, uh, I, I do a lot of work with the health department in Baltimore, and the family from the corner, uh, Fran, yeah. Um, I work with her on a regular basis. Oh my basis. goodness, yeah. Do you, uh, do you still have contact with of her? Of course, yeah. Okay, yeah, she's, she's changed her life and is helping well, people with drug she's addiction. She's a great, great lady. Yeah, so great I just wanted to thank you for putting her story out there for That's everybody. So. Okay, that was just a comment. Get up here. You, you. Yeah, we got, that was just a comment. So we got time for two more, but uh, quick. I just want to know if we still had time for the ripple in the water story. We don't have time okay. for that. Sit oh. down. <laughs> no, no, <okay. laughs> That's the bowling ball. Okay, me. all right. You can do it, but you have to do like the, the two-minute version. We'll, no, we'll close with that. You can okay, all right. Hi. Uh, both your shows, or, or all the shows you've made, are very cinematic. How do you work with storyboards or other means to go from the writing to what's on screen? Um, I'll say this. I, um, I love uh, collaborating. I love writing a script. Uh, sharing it with the other writers on the staff, getting their thoughts, giving it to a director, getting his or her thoughts, uh, and then giving it to the actors. Um, I don't ever want to direct. I have no taste for it, and I don't even have the legs for it anymore because it takes, oh, there's a lot of standing. Um, and so, so my feeling is if, if somebody comes and can show me something and make me go, oh shit, that's great, then uh, that's what I want. And I'm not going to pretend to say, this needs to have a hue of blah, 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 because I don't know enough about that kind of stuff. Yeah, same. I go, I'm not a DGA member. I go to set. I look in the monitor. I know if a scene's going wrong. Yeah. And, I, and I can react to that. And I say, I'm not getting it, or, or, you know, or, or I need this, or I can do that. I can be that. I can't be creative. Uh, it's important to know your limitations. Okay, the bowling ball story. So I'm giving Tom notes, and dutifully, you know, like, okay, probable cause wouldn't work that way, this Tom. This is homicide, or, by you know, the way, yeah. Yeah, on homicide. And, um, or, you know, the, the, you can't drive that way on St. Paul Street. It's one way in that place, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am a nonfiction boy, and, you know, I'm just a pest. But one day, he moves a script, and there's this scene, some of you may remember it, where... Kellerman and Meldrick Lewis are standing, there's been this sort of existential torment over, over their lives, and, and there's been this case where a guy threw a bowling ball off a highway and killed somebody, he went through the windshield and killed the driver. And so they're standing out on the back of the pier looking over the water, and uh, Kellerman, who is in torment, just lets the ball roll, and it splash, and like, you know, the ripples, you know, the beautiful, elegaic moment of, of you know, existential torment. And, and the, that was, I think, you know, the end of that sequence in the episode. And he, Tom gets a note from me that says, you know, Tom, that bowling ball, um, that's evidence. And it, it, needs to go, it needs to go to ECU. <laughs> and it needs to be categorized. And there would be paperwork. And, you know, you can't just take evidence out and not return it. And, you know. <laughs> so he gets this note, and I think, that's going to cut it. That's like the final straw from Nonfiction Boy. And instead, like, the script, the blue pages come back, and it says... It says, like, they stand there for a moment, silently, the ripples, beautifully, and, they, you know, and then Lewis turns to him and says, you know that's evidence. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have to send the divers down to get that now. <laughs> so I thought, like, progress. You know, progress. <laughs> <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tom Fontana, David Simon. Thank all of you for coming out.